Hi, I'm Jason Levine. Today we're doing a deep dive on virtual reality. We have a fascinating interview with the guy who literally wrote the book about using VR in cinematic storytelling. Then we go behind the scenes at bleeding edge VR production company Practical Magic. And we talk with our own Chris Babatis about the future of VR and AR. This week on Make It. Well, Grant, thanks so much for joining me in the studio today. It's really great to meet you in person, finally. Yeah, you too, thanks. I know everyone has so many questions about VR, but specifically the reason I brought you here today is to really talk about VR in terms of cinema. And what are really the elements that you know, define a VR production in this kind of cinema scope? So there's two main types of VR, really. There's the cinematic VR, which is the filmed VR. You see in a lot of these virtual reality cameras um, that consist of anywhere from, you know, well, three, two to three to 24 lenses in there. All right. um, that all gets stitched together to create a um, hopefully fully 360 3D image. Right. Um, and then there's the game-based VR, um, which is more interactive. And then there's the hybrid stuff, where you have the cinematic VR because people want realism um, and you know natural-looking images, but you also have to have some interactivity in there. You really have got to have interactivity um, right. because you do feel so present in this medium, right? Like you're actually there. Now, more recently, of course, you've had some huge uh, opportunities working with companies like Jaunt, right? Mm -hmm. You had a couple years stint there. So how did you kind of get involved with Jaunt and working there? Yeah, um, I was one of the very early employees. Um, it started out as a tech company um, up here in Palo Alto, um, creating an amazing you know, VR camera system like I was talking about, right. one of those cameras. I'm sure you've probably seen it. <laughs> right. um, that allowed you to very easily stitch together through a cloud-based system all of these images um, and really experimenting with how best to use this new language in terms of, you know, cutting and, you know, over the shoulders and close-ups and all these things that you do in 2D don't necessarily right. apply in VR. And so right. really learning what works, what doesn't, and, um, you know, how we can really leverage that. I still hear in the communities there's a bit of confusion like 3D versus VR versus stereoscopic VR. You know, yeah, and how these things, and that's of... a huge, a huge point for me, especially. Um, I've always said there's a certain number of things that you have to have for it to be considered VR, and that's um, fully 360 degrees, right. 3D, experienced in a headset with spatialized sound. Right. But then I also think the more and more and more that we're experiencing virtual reality, you really have to have that fifth component, which is interactivity. interactivity. Yep. And that's tough to do in cinematic VR because right. you know the technology is such that you're not going to be able to move within that image unless the camera itself is moving. Right. And if you move the camera, you can make people sick. So there's new technologies coming up that actually allow you to move within this cinematic image. So that's definitely gonna be helping and helping push the, the art forward as well. Right. You had a quote that I thought was really interesting and maybe you could elaborate a little bit on that. AR will be your next, your new computing platform. VR will be the escape. VR led the whole game, but now with AR Kit and AR Core, right. you know, Apple and uh, Google's Android efforts. So AR now, at least from a cell phone perspective, is really gonna start leading the charge, I think. You're gonna right. start seeing it really start to monetize, um, and it, ultimately it will become the new computing platform of the future. First it'll be tethered to your iPhone, then it'll be self-contained, right. kind of like Apple Watch. Right. Um, and then this is gonna be your computing platform. This is gonna be your daily life. You're gonna be living in this. But just like, you know, we go to work every day, right. we want to unwind. Turn and so, off afterwards, right. Yeah, you wanna shut off the outside world. And so that's where VR comes in. And okay. it's more like, you know, you're in your man cave and watching TV, right. or you go to the movie theater and, you know, you tune out the outside world and you're immersed in this alternate reality. And that's what virtual reality will be. It's emerging so rapidly that there are absolutely careers now dedicated to AR, as you just discussed, whether it's app production or whatever. So what might someone expect? What are they gonna find in this book that kind of yeah, guides Yeah, so it you? was uh, Best Practices in Cinematic Virtual Reality. Um, it's at Jaunt's website, I still believe it, blog.jauntvr.com, mm -hmm. people wanna download it. It was written for filmmakers, really, who, you know, it's not filmmaking 101, but right. it's like people who understand 2D filmmaking and have no idea, what do I do with VR? What is all this crazy stuff? Right. You know, like we were talking about, having no frame and how do you capture the viewer's attention? What if I wanna do a close-up? What about right. moving the camera? Right. You know, you wanna move that camera. Every director wants to move that camera. That's right. Um, and frame size considerations, right? So this was something else you said where with VR, your baseline now is really 4K, right? And we're already, 8K is kind of where you want to be. There's some 2K stuff still going on, but 4K really is the baseline now, rapidly trending towards 8K. 
So now tell me, are there particular types of stories or types of films that really lend themselves better to a VR interactive experience? I think anything can work in that. But obviously the low-hanging fruit and what we've seen a lot, obviously, are the games. But sci-fi, horror. But I really think drama um, has a huge potential, but it's got to be done right. It's, I always say that I think when we haven't seen the killer app yet for VR. Right. But we, I think it's going to be a lot like interactive theater. Everybody talks about Sleep No More, mm -hmm. which is the interactive theater piece in New York. Right. Um, and that's kind of what I think you're going to see, and that's where the interaction comes in. And some of the pieces that I'm working on coming up, um, we're doing a, a, a space piece based on the universe, um, which is more documentary in style, so that stuff is great in VR. And then we're doing this piece on the Tibetan Book of the Dead, um, yeah. the Bardo Thodol, which right. is, you know, uh, basically your... Uh, what your consciousness experiences in the transition from life to death to rebirth. It's fun to use virtual reality for going places that you never actually could go. Right. Matt, I know, I can't wait to see it. Actually, and again, just hearing you talk about it, I mean, I think with anything, and I think this is something which you can say about producing VR, 3D, stereoscopic, or standard 2D, or any kind of cinematic film, I mean, you have to have that passion for it, and the passion is absolutely coming through in how you're describing this. And I think if the yeah. person behind creating this, whether you're inspiring new creators here or elsewhere, it has to feel the same. You have to be inspired by the technology and the coolness of it, but you have to really want to create something new and unique. Yeah, and that's right. what drew me to this. You know, I worked in film for 20 plus years, and you know, this is, you don't get the opportunity in your life, maybe once, right. if you're lucky, right. to get on board on the ground floor of, of a brand new medium right. and help so develop new. the language and help push that creativity. Yeah. Well, Grant, thank you so much for joining me here at the, the Make It stage today. And you know, there are a few companies uh, that are doing some incredible VR production work. One of them is Practical Magic. So let's send it over to Hyla, who's talking with Matt Lewis, about some of the incredible VR productions he's working on right now. Matt Lewis, thank you for letting us hang out in your adult playground. <laughs> that, yeah, they're goondocks, right? Uh, practical magic, for those who don't know. We like to call ourselves a creative engineering company. If you're a movie studio and you've got a problem that you need solving, and you know, if you're Disney, you call the Imagineers, but if you're Fox or Universal or Warner Brothers, maybe you call us. Give me some examples of, of some crazy requests that you've gotten over the years. Some of the things that are becoming more common, like scanning sets for, mm -hmm. you know, they bring in big scanners and they, they want to recreate a movie set. Sometimes they have a very large movie set and we need to do that from the air. So going to the middle of the Mediterranean Sea and scanning an old castle from a helicopter, that's a little bit of an unusual one. If we build unusual camera rigs, they'll need to do mm -hmm. a difficult shot. We'll figure out how to build a rig that will let the camera do what the director wants. Tell me about your dead alien bodies no, that you throw away in the trash it, it, all the time. It's, it's kind of non-specific. It turns out when you try to throw away a stack of burned corpses wrapped in the sheets, the, 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 the trash people tend to find that suspicious. <laughs> and we have a lot of questions we have to answer, which usually ends up unwrapping a body and poking it and being like, it's, it's not real, it's not real. It's a little uncomfortable having to explain that. All right, so Matt Lewis taking us to the adventures of having an adventurous playground. Yeah, here. right. Yeah, what are some of the things that you guys are fabricating from scratch? Right now, it's a lot of VR camera systems, actually. We'll come up with a way to uh, stabilize a virtual reality camera. We'll build an electric go-kart mm -hmm. that will let a very small camera cart that will let you speed in and out of tunnels and the camera's remote and stabilized. We'll build the support equipment around the camera to make the shot possible. Talk about some of the magic now that you guys have to create from scratch. There's always a little bit of practical in our magic and a little bit <laughs> of magic in our practical. So we might have to make cars flip in a specific way or, or build something that hasn't been built before or shoot something that hasn't been shot before. And that's really how we got into virtual reality. Our first VR project was with Google. Justin Lin was directing a project for Google called Help, and that was a VR project. It was for Google Spotlight Stories. And Justin wanted to shoot his VR project with cinema cameras. So what we had to do was fabricate a system that allowed him to put four red Epic Dragon cinema cameras on this large overhead camera rig, everything would be in sync and that Justin could you know, see all the cameras at the same time and he could see it wirelessly so that they could do chases and move the camera in and out of tunnels and the director would have a view in VR to see what he was shooting. What is that like to, to be working on the front lines, the frontier of this type of tech? We're the ones that actually have to deliver on the promise. So when a director like Justin Lin or Christopher Nolan read in the news what's possible, and they start to get excited about virtual reality, then they sit down in a meeting with me, 
I'm the one that has to bring them back down to earth and say, look, I know that you're hearing this and that, you're seeing these things in the news, but what's really possible now is very different. Let's talk about Dunkirk VR. Sure. Uh, take yeah. me through your, your first call with Mr. Nolan and yeah. what that was like. No, we met in person on the Warner Brothers lot, and this is a man who knows what he wants. He's an extraordinary talent. So when you're in a room with him and you're, th you're thinking about, well, how do we do a virtual reality experience that's, you know, up to his expectations, that's a hard conversation to have. Are you saying, hey, I'm not 100% sure I can bring your vision to life, or are you, in your mind, trying to figure out how to do it regardless? Well, I would say I'm definitely 100% sure that I can't, I, I don't think anybody could bring a Chris Nolan scale vision to life in, with current VR technology. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is a, he makes some of the biggest films in the world using some of the best technology, and VR just isn't there yet. So the conversation was very much around what you just said, which is is what is possible good enough for right. for you know the, to get the Chris Nolan sign off. So once you got the green light, what were the next steps? We got the green light, and I was on a plane to France. Uh, we decided what to do in that meeting. Uh, if you've seen Dunkirk, you know that the film kind of takes place in three different parts. There's a land part, a sea part, and an air part. So we had to think about how do we translate that Dunkirk land sea air you know, concept to VR. How do you put someone in the sea and what do you, what do they do while they're there? We came up with this concept of the soldiers drowning and you're kind of cued to look around by sound and by flashes and things that are, you know, inspiring you to, to explore your environment. So are you working on the story with Christopher Nolan? Yes. Wow. So we wrote this, I wrote the script for the VR piece and um, Chris's team at Syncope Essentially, we went back and forth on a script until we agreed on something. Well, I want to go check out Dunkirk VR. Let's go check it out. Matt, thank you so much for your help. Yeah. Thank you. Right. Okay, so walk me through. What do I need to do? Yeah, pull it on. Put it on. Got does it. Does it feel good? It feels snug. Feels good? All right. You got your controller. Uh, you, oh, that, there you oh you can yeah, see it. it's a and virtual I look around, controller. Look around for the play control. You see it? And ah. just point, point at the play button and pull the trigger. Okay. Look around, see what you can see. Oh, I'm on the beach. It's beautiful out here. Wow. Whoa. Dead bodies floating in the water. Not chill. Bullets. Whoa. There's something I didn't see before. That was the plane impact. We used miniatures for the for the plane. It was an actual miniature plane. It wasn't digital. Oh wait, I'm on a plane now. It doesn't look like it's. Oh, I'm flying. Okay. So how many planes were involved? Oh, that's Whoa. okay. I will admit to having forgotten it now. Come on, Sully. You can save this one. Everything's authentic as close as possible to the film. The digital effects, the plane, all of those are models from the, from the film. Where is that coming from? <laughs> all right, that, that's incredible. Round of applause in the whole room. <laughs> from all eight It's of probably us. not as cinematically uh, uh, intense watching me around a bunch of black phones. That was pretty fun watching you do it. But that's <laughs> incredible, man. Thanks. How is writing for VR different than it's writing for... Everybody's got their own way of doing it, and so I had to kind of choose how do I want to write the script, and I tend to refer to the VR viewer almost as a character and describe what they can see. It's a very different way of thinking about filmmaking or storytelling than the director being able to choose exactly what the viewer sees, the viewer might choose to see something else in mm -hmm. VR. And that's a, that's a huge disconnect for a lot of directors. Like, I, I, I want the viewer to look here right now. It's like, well, you can't necessarily force that. Right. The viewer might be looking this way. It's like, as I was watching you watch it, like, there was a couple times where you were looking at something you were interested in, and the plane hit the water behind you, and you heard it, and your head popped up, and you looked around, and you found it. But you didn't necessarily see the moment of impact. And so there's a lot of thought going into, from an engineering perspective, or from a software perspective, or from a player perspective, how do we ensure that the director can focus the viewer's view in those key moments and make sure you don't miss that superhero? What are some tips for people that are just getting into it? Don't worry about the technology. Just focus on the storytelling. Yeah. Um, the technology is going to come because it has to, and that's not their problem. And as soon as we, you know, companies like Adobe continue to evolve these tools that allow filmmakers to tell stories in VR, and they're going to get exponentially better over the coming years, um, I think you're going to start seeing people have better ideas. Like, nobody's made Gone with the Wind VR yet. I mean, you know, and I, like, figuratively speaking, like, nobody's made that seminal 
that gotcha. VR piece that everybody looks back on in the timeline and says that was the moment that it cracked. And that's really exciting to think about as being in the future. Right, like, so no know. one's gotten that pot of gold yet. It could be yeah. you. Right, as we stand here having this conversation right now, right. that moment is in all of our collective futures as artists, and anybody could grab it. Thanks for coming out, man. Yeah, I, really I appreciate, appreciate it. This was a lot of fun. This has been great. Well, Chris, thanks so much for joining me here on The Make It Show. It's really great to have you. We're talking about VR and immersive technologies, and you've really been in this world for really quite some time, so I thought maybe we could kind of talk a bit about your origins with virtual reality, with the beginnings of true immersive technologies, and kind of how this has changed and evolved to where we are today. Truth be told, we don't we don't have a history in, in immersive back to the 90s. Okay. Immersive was fairly new to us. I mean, in, insofar as it's modern, rendition. Um, we only touched on it about three and a half, four years ago. One of the first things I actually did uh, when we joined Adobe, I worked closely with the Photoshop team and got them to support Immersive. When we started, it was, it was an After Effects solution only because we knew that world extremely well, right? And a lot of the work that's done in Immersive right now is still leaning heavily on the After Effects side, right? right. If you've invested in After Effects and you understood After Effects and Premiere Pro well, well, why would I try to introduce new notions, right. new UX notions? So the thinking was just keep the artists working the way they know and let right. them focus on the artistry and the storytelling. Moving forward, we're going to try to get as many of our products supporting immersive as possible. Right. It's all about democratization. Right. The hardware is getting cheaper. Everything's getting a lot more accessible. Right. Stitching, which was one of the biggest pain right. points is almost happening in camera at a professional level right. right now. That's incredible. And pretty but, much after you hit stop, I well, mean, it's... It's ready to it's go. It's ready to we, go. We, we, I've seen cameras that are streaming in stereo, stitching in line in real time with no right. latency, right? right? We've tapped into the artisans and the storytellers of this industry, right? That's the After Effects artist that I refer to as the right. artisan, right? And then the storytellers being the premier pro artists, right, most of the time. This is the real gold. Anything we do has to be easy, accessible, it has to feel natural. Right. We're going to hit a wall. There's no doubt, Jason. I mean, from a UX standpoint. Right, from a UX standpoint. Yeah. Right, but I think hitting it will be pleasant and we'll overcome that together. And I think this is the most exciting part for me, is that what is storytelling like in this medium? What's it like when it's an AR experience or a mixed reality or extended reality right. experience, right? You have a headset on. You're contributing in real time. Right to the story, how do we deal with that? That's more, it's actually between, if you think about it, between theater and real life, right? right? Um, but I know something that you're very passionate about and that people are becoming more and more aware of is or are the additives of ambisonic and spatial audio as part of that yes. um, entire process. And maybe you could talk a little bit about how you're sort of kind of paving the way for Adobe and yourself to kind of do more in that space too, because that's an essential that's an essential part of the immersive experience. It's paramount. Um, I think moving forward, what I'd like to do is uh, get a lot more usability and UX involved, right? right? Mm -hmm. The thinking is, is that if we get that in play, it serves beyond spatial audio. Even if you're doing Absolutely. very simple stereo mixing, right. if I've got a visual aid that make it your life easier, mm -hmm. uh, uh, it's great. Uh, there's a recent experience in, uh, that I saw at Sundance I get invited, I get a preview, and then the producer or the creator is asking me, what do you think? Mm -hmm. uh, I think I gave it one of the best compliments. I said, I could have closed my eyes and had just as rich of an experience mm. because your sound was impeccable. Right. Just beautifully done. Spatial audio, right. done right, it felt right, it, it told the story in and of itself, right? And if you think about it, you get that with radio. Right. Absolutely. Right. I can't wait to see what's coming next. So, same here. Well, Chris, again, I want to thank you so much for joining me here on the show and just to get your insight and really your vision and passion. So, thank you, thank you so much. Yeah, and I also want to thank our guests, Grant and Matt, as well as Hyla, for joining us in this VR experience here on The Make It Show. And this is what we do. We feature incredible creatives, incredible stuff, incredible humans like yourself, Chris. Thank you again. We hope to see you again right here on the Creative Cloud YouTube channel. We'll see you next time on Make It. Thank you.